THE SECRET GARDEN BY FRANCIS HODGSON BURNETT CHAPTER Eighteen. THE MONOT WASTE NO TIME Of course, Mary did not waken early the next morning. She slept late because she was tired, and when Martha brought her breakfast, she told her that though Colin was quite quiet, he was ill and feverish, as he always was after he had worn himself out with a fit of crying. Mary ate her breakfast slowly as she listened. "'He says he wishes thou would please go and see him as soon as the can,' Martha said. "'It's queer what a fancy he's took to thee. Thou did give it him last night for sure, didn't thou? Nobody else would have dared to do it. Eh, poor lad, he's been spoiled till salt won't save him. Mother says as the two worst things as can happen to a child is never to have his own way, or always to have it. She doesn't know which is the worst. Thou was in a fine temper thyself, too. But he says to me when I went into his room, Please ask Miss Mary if she'll please come and talk to me. Think o' him saying please. Will you go, Miss? I'll run and see Dickon first, said Mary. No, I'll go and see Colin first, and tell him— I know what I'll tell him. With a sudden inspiration. She had her hat on when she appeared in Colin's room, and for a second he looked disappointed. He was in bed. His face was pitifully white, and there were dark circles round his eyes. "'I'm glad you came,' he said. "'My head aches, and I ache all over because I'm so tired. Are you going somewhere?' Mary went and leaned against his bed. "'I won't be long,' she said. "'I'm going to Dickon, but I'll come back. Colin, it's—it's it's something about the garden.' His whole face brightened, and a little colour came into it. "'Oh, is it?' he cried out. "'I dreamed about it all night. I heard you say something about grey changing into green, and I dreamed I was standing in a place all filled with trembling little green leaves, and there were birds on nests everywhere, and they looked so soft and still. I'll lie and think about it until you come back.' In five minutes Mary was with Dickon in their garden. The fox and the crow were with him again, and this time he had brought two tame squirrels. "'I came over on the pony this morning,' he said. "'Eh, hey, he is a good little chap. Jump is. I brought these two in my pockets. This here one he's called Nut, and this here other one's called Shell.' When he said Nut, one squirrel leaped onto his right shoulder— and when he said shell, the other one leaped onto his left shoulder. When they sat down on the grass with Captain curled at their feet, Soot solemnly listening on a tree, and Nut and Shell nosing about close to them, it seemed to Mary that it would be scarcely bearable to leave such delightfulness. But when she began to tell her story, somehow the look in Dickens' funny face gradually changed her mind. She could see he felt sorrier for Colin than she did. He looked up at the sky and all about him. "'Just listen to them birds. The world seems full of em, all whistlin' and pipin,' he said. "'Look at em dartin' about, and harkin' at em callin' to each other. Come springtime seems like as if all the world's callin'. The leaves is uncurlin' so you can see em, and my word, the nice smells there is about.' "'sniffing with his happy turned-up nose. "'And that poor lad lying shut up "'and seeing so little that he gets to thinking of things "'as sets him screaming. "'Eh, my, we mun get him out here. "'We mun get him watching and listening and sniffing up the air, "'and get him just soaked through with sunshine. "'And we mun not lose no time about it.' "'When he was very much interested, "'he often spoke quite broad Yorkshire, "'though at other times he tried to modify his dialect.' so that Mary could better understand. But she loved his broad Yorkshire, and had in fact been trying to learn to speak it herself, so she spoke a little now. "'Aye, that we mun,' she said, which meant, "'Yes, indeed, we must.' "'I'll tell thee what us'll do first. 
she proceeded, and Dickon grinned, because when the little wench tried to twist her tongue into speaking Yorkshire, it amused him very much. "'He's took a gradely fancy to thee. He wants to see thee, and he wants to see Soot and Captain. When I go back to the house to talk to him, I'll ax him if thou canna come and see him to-morrow mornin, and bring the creatures with thee. And then, in a bit, when there's more leaves out, and happen a bud or two, we'll get him to come out, and thou shall push him in his chair, and we'll bring him here and show him everything.' When she stopped, she was quite proud of herself. She had never made a long speech in Yorkshire before, and she had remembered very well. "'A mun talk of it a Yorkshire like that to Mr. Cullen,' Dickon chuckled. "'Thou'll make him laugh, and there's nowt as good for ill folk as laughin is. Mother says she believes as a half-hour's good laugh every mornin' would cure a chap as was makin' ready for typhus fever.' "'I'm going to talk Yorkshire to him this very day,' said Mary, chuckling herself. The garden had reached the time when every day and every night it seemed as if magicians were passing through it, drawing loveliness out of the earth and the boughs with wands. It was hard to go away and leave it all, particularly as Nut had actually crept on to her dress, and Shell had scrambled down the trunk of the apple-tree they sat under, and stayed there looking at her with inquiring eyes. But she went back to the house, and when she sat down close to Colin's bed, he began to sniff, as Dickon did, though not in such an experienced way. "'You smell like flowers, and—and and fresh things,' he cried out quite joyously. "'What is it you smell of? It's cool and warm and sweet, all at the same time.' "'It's the wind from the moor,' said Mary. "'It comes a-sittin' on the grass under a tree "'wi' Dickon and wi' Captain and Soot and Nut and Shell. "'It's the springtime and out doors and sunshine, "'as smells so gradely. "'She said it as broadly as she could, "'and you do not know how broadly Yorkshire sounds "'until you have heard someone speak it. "'Colin began to laugh. "'What are you doing?' he said. "'I never heard you talk like that before. "'How funny it sounds!' "'I'm given thee a bit o' Yorkshire,' answered Mary triumphantly. "'I canna talk as gradely as Dickon and Martha can, "'but the seas I can shape a bit. "'Doesn't thou understand a bit o' Yorkshire when thou hears it? "'And thou a Yorkshire lad thy cell, bred and born. "'Eh, I wonder thou art not ashamed o' thy face.' "'And then she began to laugh, too, "'and they both laughed until they could not stop themselves, "'and they laughed until the room echoed.' and Mrs. Medlock, opening the door to come in, drew back into the corridor, and stood listening, amazed. "'Well, upon my word,' she said, speaking rather broad Yorkshire herself, because there was no one to hear her, and she was so astonished. "'Who ever heard the like? Who ever on earth would have thought it?' There was so much to talk about. It seemed as if Colin could never hear enough of Dickon and Captain and Soot and Nut and Shell, and the pony whose name was Jump. Mary had run round into the wood with Dickon to see Jump. He was a tiny little shaggy moor pony, with thick locks hanging over his eyes, and with a pretty face and a nuzzling velvet nose. He was rather thin with living on moor grass, but he was as tough and wiry as if the muscle in his little legs had been made of steel springs. He had lifted his head and whinnied softly the moment he saw Dickon, and he had trotted up to him and put his head across his shoulder, and then Dickon had talked into his ear, and Jump had talked back in odd little whinnies and puffs and snorts. Dickon had made him give Mary his small front hoof and kiss her on the cheek with his velvet muzzle. "'Does he really understand everything Dickon says?' Colin asked. "'It seems as if he does,' answered Mary. "'Dickon says anything will understand, if you're friends with it for sure, but you have to be friends for sure.' Colin lay quiet a little while, and his strange grey eyes seemed to be staring at the wall, but Mary saw he was thinking. "'I wish I was friends with things.' he said at last. But I'm not. 
I never had anything to be friends with, and I can't bear people. Can't you bear me? asked Mary. Yes, I can, he answered. It's funny, but I even like you. Ben Weatherstaff said I was like him, said Mary. He said he'd warrant we'd both got the same nasty tempers. I think you are like him, too. We are all three alike, you and I and Ben Weatherstaff. He said we were neither of us much to look at, and we were as sour as we looked. But I don't feel as sour as I used to before I knew the robin and Dickon. Did you feel as if you hated people? Yes, answered Mary, without any affectation. I should have detested you if I had seen you before I saw the robin and Dickon. Colin put out his thin hand and touched her. Mary, he said, I wish I hadn't said what I did about sending Dickon away. I hated you when you said he was like an angel, and I laughed at you, but, but perhaps he is. Well, it was rather funny to say it, she admitted frankly, because his nose does turn up, and he has a big mouth, and his clothes have patches all over them, and he talks broad Yorkshire, but, but if an angel did come to Yorkshire and live on the moor, if there was a Yorkshire angel, I believe he'd understand the green things and know how to make them grow, and he would know how to talk to the wild creatures as Dickon does, and they'd know he was friends for sure. I shouldn't mind Dickon looking at me, said Colin. I want to see him. I'm glad you said that, answered Mary, because, because, quite suddenly it came into her mind that this was the minute to tell him. Colin knew something new was coming. "'Because what?' he cried eagerly. Mary was so anxious that she got up from her stool and came to him and caught hold of both his hands. "'Can I trust you? I trusted Dickon because birds trusted him. Can I trust you, for sure, for sure?' she implored. Her face was so solemn that he almost whispered his answer. "'Yes, yes.' "'Well, Dickon will come to see you tomorrow morning, "'and he'll bring his creatures with him.' "'Oh, oh!' Colin cried out in delight. "'But that's not all,' Mary went on, "'almost pale with solemn excitement. "'The rest is better. "'There is a door into the garden. "'I found it. "'It is under the ivy on the wall.' If he had been a strong, healthy boy, Colin would probably have shouted, Hooray! 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 But he was weak and rather hysterical. His eyes grew bigger and bigger, and he gasped for breath. Oh, Mary! he cried out with a half sob. Shall I see it? Shall I get into it? Shall I live to get into it? And he clutched her hands and dragged her toward him. Of course you'll see it, snapped Mary indignantly. "'Of course you'll live to get into it. Don't be silly.' And she was so unhysterical and natural and childish that she brought him to his senses, and he began to laugh at himself. And a few minutes afterward she was sitting on her stool again telling him not what she imagined the secret garden to be like, but what it really was, and Colin's aches and tiredness were forgotten, and he was listening enraptured. "'It is just what you thought it would be,' he said at last. "'It sounds just as if you had really seen it. "'You know I said that when you told me first. "'Mary hesitated about two minutes, "'and then boldly spoke the truth. "'I had seen it, and I had been in,' she said. "'I found the key and got in weeks ago, but I daren't tell you. I daren't, because I was so afraid I couldn't trust you for sure. End of chapter 18 Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 9th, 2006 in Oceanside, California.